the Rising Sun Ensign, the iconic banner marking out a ship of the Imperial Japanese Navy, here at the head of a flotilla of vessels making its way through the waters of Marseille in southern France on their way to defend British shipping out of North Africa. What? Well, in this video, most generously sponsored by Boksu, and more to come about them later on, I promise, uh, I'll explain exactly how this strange juxtaposition, at least strange compared to what we're normally used to seeing, uh, came about. Now, for the longest time, whenever I imagined the role of Imperial Japan in the First World War, I basically thought of a Far Eastern garrison state. They swept in at the start of the war, ate up a bunch of poorly defended little German colonies, and that's basically it, a vulture state or a carrion bird state of some kind as it's often described. Uh, the furthest extent, so I thought, of their contribution was really just to deny Germany resources and free up British naval assets which could be redirected to the more important European theater. And I think that's a pretty popular image of World War I Japan as well. It's shared by a lot of people. So when a friend of mine told me about how the Japanese actually sent a pretty sizable naval detachment to the Mediterranean to help protect Allied shipping against German and Austrian U-boats, I was pretty surprised by that. And when I learned about just how significant that contribution was to the war effort, well, I was quite shocked. Japan, as it turns out, was far more deserving of that seat at the negotiating table than I first thought. It was in February of 1917 that the Central Powers resumed their policy of unrestricted submarine warfare, meaning that their U-boats would target not only Allied warships, but troop transports and cargo ships as well. And when that happens, the British Royal Navy, making up the bulk of Allied naval power by far, is suddenly pressed once again to defend incredibly vast swaths of ocean, including, most importantly, the North Atlantic and the Mediterranean. And keep in mind that suddenly worrying about these hundreds of troop transports and supply ships and the like, any of which could now be attacked at a moment's notice without warning or a chance to escape, you know, previously uh, it would have to be the case like a submarine would have to give the civilian vessel a chance to surrender as a prize of war and everything and like try and take ownership of it and everything. It's a huge mess as far as uh, the usual customs are concerned, but when they decide to do away with all that and just see, oh look, carrying military supplies, sink it things become a lot more difficult as far as um, defending those ships or allowing those ships to get away and the like. Uh, they also need, the, the British Navy that is, to maintain a massive fleet to blockade Germany itself and keep the German high seas fleet bottled up in port lest it should escape and start bombarding Britain itself. That wouldn't be very good in the papers. Uh, and that is, of course, alongside their regular peacetime job of policing the largest global empire that the world has ever seen. During World War I, the Royal Navy may well be, yes, the single most powerful force on the entire planet. But even still, it is spread thin, and it's hard-pressed to do its job. To give you a good sense of scale, of just how dramatically this resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare changed the game, during the entirety of the war, it's 1914 to 1918, the British lost some 12 million tons of shipping. And very nearly half of that amount was from February to December of 1917, just under a year's time. And a significant portion of that shipping was being lost in the Mediterranean, about 3 million tons lost there altogether. Again, to give you a good sense of the scale of this problem and how it ramped up with this unrestricted submarine warfare, in April of 1917 alone, over 200,000 tons of shipping were lost, that being around 7% of losses through the entire war in the Mediterranean in a single month. The resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare may not necessarily sound like it's all too big of a deal, but it's changing the dynamic of the war significantly and rapidly. In fact, according to one article I found, the Allies may have even considered rerouting some of that shipping around the Cape of Good Hope, that is, around South Africa, rather than using the Suez Canal because of how dangerous the Mediterranean waters were becoming. That is the severity of the situation facing the British Empire and the Allies on the whole when they request aid from the Japanese government. 
Now, initially, of course, the Japanese were hesitant. Uh, the other allies had requested aid numerous times up to this point, though it was pretty much always refused for logistical reasons if that aid went outside of the Pacific, for reasons what you very well could imagine, I'm sure. Uh, it was when the Japanese were given more concrete promises of support uh, relating to their claims on the former German colonies in the Pacific uh, that finally a deal was reached. And uh, the deal that they do come to, the arrangement, would come in the form of the Second Special Squadron. The squadron was rapidly put together by the Imperial Navy, and by mid-March, a cruiser and eight destroyers were sailing for Europe, arriving in Malta by the 16th of April. Over the course of the next few months, that initial force would expand to uh, three Japanese cruisers, the Akashi, the Izumo, and the Nishin, and there will also be some more Japanese words being pronounced during the course of this video, and probably all incorrectly, I apologize for that, um, alongside 12 destroyers, uh, among a few other ships that were later lent to the Japanese. Uh, we'll talk more about that soon enough, though. Um, so it's quite a significant force altogether. Uh, this force would carry with them a most vital supply of something called boksu, bright orange boxes filled to the brim with delicious and authentic Japanese snacks and carefully curated tea pairings. That's right, everyone, it's time for the sponsorship message. Uh, boksu is the only Japanese snack box company that partners with 100-plus-year-old family companies to bring authentic Japanese fare directly to your doorstep. Every box ships straight from Japan, and you can order the boxes individually or take up a subscription service with a different distinctive theme arriving at your doorstep every month. It's like a gourmet journey to the Far East with every new box and the new themes. Uh, like I said, of course, each one is filled to the brim. Uh, you can see here the wide variety of different snacks which I received from them. Chocolate, salty, and sweet, all these different things. Um, each one also comes with a tea uh, that is specially paired to the flavors held within. Every box also contains a delightful little cultural guide which will explain what everything is, what's in it, including like allergy information, things like that, uh, what region of Japan the snacks are all from, and of course the inspiration for that month's box. Uh, for example, you can see here that the theme of my box was most delightfully called Seasons of Japan. Personally, my favorites were the Don Don Yaki Cracker, I have no idea what this is. A, a little cracker? A, a nut? It's salty and crunchy? I don't know, but it's good. So there you go. You can have things like this. Uh, they're apparently fried senbei, uh, marinated in tonkatsu sauce. Uh, I, I have no idea what any of that actually means, but, but it was delicious. I enjoyed them a great deal. I, they came with two bags in there, and I ate them both. Uh, pretty much within the first couple of minutes. Um, alongside of all things, the, the red bean donuts. I, I didn't even know you could make donuts out of red beans. Like, not a thing that I'm used to in my own cultural setting, uh, but all the same, they were wonderful. I really enjoyed them. Uh, look here, I even forced my father on camera to try some of them himself. Hello, everybody. Brandon asked me to try one, so I will. Hokkaido red bean donuts. Sounds fabulous. None for you. <laughs> oh, no, no. Stop it. Wow, good. Good stuff. Where do I sign up? Why, I'm glad you asked, sir. Visit the link in the description down below today. And when you do, use code BRANZENF10 to receive 10% off of your order, a value of up to $47 should you order a full year subscription. And after all, what better way is there to celebrate a new year and many new beginnings than with all sorts of new delightful flavors? Thank you so very much to Boxu for sponsoring this video, making it possible, and thank you, my dear viewer, for your time. Now, back to the second special squadron, which incidentally did not actually carry Japanese snack foods to the Allied war effort. Uh, that was just for the purpose of the advertisement, but I'm sure you all know that. Anyways, the force when they arrive in Europe had a nominal level of independence, but acted according to the orders of British Admiral George Alexander Ballard, who was superintendent of the Malta dockyards at the time. Now, immediately, the British put their new allies to the 
admittedly not terribly glorious, but still immensely important task of guarding convoys against U-boat attacks. And the 2nd Special Squadron would do so very, very well. Over the next year and a half, the Imperial Navy would escort nearly 800 Allied ships across some 348 separate escort missions, uh, that being an average of just over 19 missions and roughly 40 ships every month. Again, let's add a sense of scale to that. Uh, now, the Wikipedia page says that the squadron escorted some 70,000 Allied troops in this way. However, I do believe that to be a mistake. A greater portion of the academic sources I found claim the figure to be over 700,000 men, uh, some going up to 750,000. Now, of course, I don't speak a lick of Japanese myself, uh, but I've been told that this might be due to a problem in translation. Uh, not every nation, shocking in the world, uses Arabic numerals, and within the Japanese system, uh, which I've been told is a 10,000 system, uh, what we would write as 750,000 is instead written as the Japanese symbol for 75, whatever that would be, uh, and then this symbol. Uh, basically, rather than saying 750,000, it is instead written as 75 ten thousands. Now, um, this is all very much outside of my wheelhouse, so don't take my word as like a absolute gospel there. Uh, and naturally, of course, if I did make any mistakes with any of that, uh, I'll be sure to add corrections down in the description below um, as far as what that all means. Uh, but you can see, at least with the rough idea there, uh, you can see how easily that might lead to very simple translation mistakes when we convert the numbering from the Japanese system to a more Arabic system, which is used in the English-speaking world. 75 ten-thousands, aka 75 multiplied by 10,000, instead becoming 75 in the ten-thousands place, if, if that makes sense at all. All it takes is one historian or, or one translator to make a very small, simple mistake, sort of fudge a, um, a, a comma somewhere, and all of a sudden, you know, they publish that source or they, they publish that material. Um, other sources then take up that number, and eventually, of course, after publishing and republishing and all that, it winds up on the Wikipedia page until eventually, at some point, maybe someone who um, speaks the language or has more original documentation can provide the clarification. Uh, all the same, like I said, uh, it seems to me like the greater proportion of scholarly sources I found are all pointing to over 700,000 being the correct figure. I cannot say for certain, but it seems to be the case. As well, I think, uh, from the perspective that I'm better versed in, uh, that being just you know, regular old military history, uh, the larger figure does still uh, make a lot more sense to me. Uh, if nearly 800 ships had been transported, yet only 70,000 troops were on them, uh, it would mean that the very, very vast majority of those vessels were for cargo and nothing else. Like, there were no soldiers being transported at all. Uh, whereas, a great portion of those vessels would most likely have been troop transports, uh, hospital ships even, you know, things like that, carrying uh, army soldiers on them. Uh, after all, a dedicated troop transport would usually have a couple thousand men on it, uh, and you're not seeing, you know, only a couple dozen or hundred guys per ship. Uh, so if even only half of those ships were carrying an average of, say, 2,000 soldiers apiece, we would get to that 700,000 figure pretty easily, as opposed to 70,000, which would mean, like, again, a small handful of transports, uh, or, you know, a lot of transports with only a couple of guys on it, which th those seem a little less likely to me. Um, uh, as well, uh, among the most uh, important of the spe second Special Squadron's uh, roles during those waning days of the war uh, came when the Germans launched their final major offensive in the spring of 1918, the Kaiserschlacht. Uh, the Japanese ships then were involved in five major convoys which moved collectively some 100,000, that's what all the sources are saying at least, uh, Allied troops to the Western Front. Um, but I know that not everyone in the world finds logistics to be uh, quite as exciting as I do. Um, there are some juicier stories to note as well. It's just, uh, again, that story sort of speaks again to the idea that we're dealing with a lot more than 70,000 troops being transported, closer to the 700,000 troops. Uh, and during the, you know, the, uh, the real uh, nail-biting moment that is the Kaiserschlacht, the Japanese were there helping to escort very, very large quantities of Allied troops to help hold back the German tide. 
But again, not everyone finds logistics to be quite so exciting as I, so on to more exciting things. Uh, while the squadron never received any confirmed U-boat kills, they did engage enemy submarines on between 34 and 38 different occasions. Uh, those numbers, too, I've sort of seen go back and forth, but only by a very little. Um, one of those engagements saw the destroyer IJN Sakaki torpedoed by U-27, resulting in the death of Sakaki's captain and 64 of her crew. Now, in response to that strike, other Japanese ships in the area made known their wrath and subjected the enemy to, quote, a six-hour depth charging that shattered its lights, smashed the compass, and sprung shaft glands, uh, forcing the enemy to limp back to Cairo. So they very nearly got a kill there, but uh, not quite. Uh, another very notable instance of heroism and diligence to their duty on the part of these Japanese vessels uh, includes when the SS Transylvania, a British merchant marine ship uh, transporting um, just over 3,000 soldiers to Egypt, was attacked on the 4th of May, 1917 by U-boat 63, while being escorted by the destroyers Matsu and, again, the Sakaki. Uh, immediately when that happened, the Sakaki broke off to engage the U-boat, sort of chasing after the thing to ward it away, uh, and the Matsu commenced uh, rescue operations. During the course of that operation, she herself was also very nearly hit by a torpedo, uh, but was able to save herself with an emergency maneuver. Uh, unfortunately, that torpedo did still hit a mark, uh, again, most unfortunately, the Transylvania. But all the same, at great risk to herself, uh, while shielded by the Sakaki, the Matsu was able to save nearly, very nearly, 3,000 lives on board the transport. Unfortunately, some 412 lives would be lost. Uh, Later, His Majesty King George V would award 27 medals to Japanese officers and sailors for their role in that rescue operation. And those were not the only laurels to be awarded to the Imperial Japanese Navy in the Mediterranean. The Japanese were lauded by their British allies for their dedication to the cause, as they spent an even greater portion of their time at sea than the Royal Navy did by certain measures. Admiral Ballard would speak very highly of the force, and particularly of its commanding officer, Admiral Kozo Sato, uh, writing, quote, French standards of efficiency are certainly lower than British, however, and Italian standards are lower still. With the Japanese, it is otherwise. Admiral Sato's destroyers are kept in a highly serviceable condition and spend at least as large a proportion of their time at sea as our own, which is far from being the case with the French and Italian vessels of any class. The Japanese, moreover, are very independent in all matters of administration and supply, whereas the French will never do anything for themselves if they get it done for them. And as if that wasn't a British enough way to uh, render praise unto an ally, similar sentiments are echoed by uh, Admiral G.C. Dickens, who was actually the commander-in-chief of, of the British Mediterranean fleet, who wrote, again much more directly, quote, Whereas Italians are inefficient, French are unreliable, and Greeks are out of the calculation, and Americans are too far away, the Japanese are excellent, but small in number. But of course, metals, as important as we make them out to be, are practically little more than tiny bits of metal and ribbon, uh, as are words of praise, even from a stiff-lipped admiral. Uh, they're easily bestowed, and indeed easily exaggerated as well. The thing that really gave me pause during this research, and uh, which really goes to show, I think, that these words of praise were not without actual substance, it wasn't just some, you know, political nicety, but there was real meaning behind it, uh, is that during the course of their work, the Japanese sailors proved so efficient at their duty that in June of 1917, the British government actually handed the squadron four British ships to be manned by Japanese hands. Two Acorn-class destroyers, uh, HMS Minstrel and HMS Nemesis, which the Japanese would temporarily rename the IJN Sendan and IJN Kanran, respectively, uh, alongside two gunboats, which the Japanese designated the Tokyo and the Saikyo. Uh, again, these ships were handed uh, back to the British after the war, but it really does speak to a lot of things, uh, primarily, again, the severity of the situation in the Mediterranean uh, and just how hard-pressed the British British Navy was, um, and, and again, the skill level of the Imperial Navy, and the level of trust that the British had in them that they're willing to give them their ships to be manned temporarily. 
Uh, similarly as well, actually, uh, looking on at all of this, the United States made a request for Japan to send two battle cruisers into the North Atlantic to help protect American troop transports, that being as late as August of 1918. And those battle cruisers seemed to be in high demand too, because a year earlier in autumn of 1917, the British had even attempted to buy two Japanese battle cruisers for North Sea operations, although that deal was also rejected. Uh, now, some points of conclusion. Uh, of course, the history of Japan in the First World War is a rather complicated thing, and I really learned that there's a lot more going on there than I ever first anticipated when I started reading about this subject. Uh, and even if they had very dramatically different reasons for fighting that conflict, as opposed to the, uh, the self-preservation, which wound up being the case for pretty much every European power that was fighting it, uh, their contributions were still very important, and there is a reason why they had a pretty good seat at the peace talks. They fought a number of battles alongside the British against various German colonies in the Pacific. They dedicated a significant number of soldiers to campaigning against the Reds in Russia. And they played a, uh, uh, quote, key role in the mobilization of the British Empire between 1914 and 1918 as they helped to transport Anzac troops over to Europe. And in the face of terrible Allied losses in the Mediterranean, they dedicated a significant naval presence to escort convoys and fight back against German and Austro-Hungarian U-boats. For those troubles, the Japanese most deservedly paraded alongside the Royal Navy under Admiralty Arch during London's Victory Parade, and they won for their nation some seven enemy ships as prizes of war, alongside concessions and recognitions in the East. Now, thank you also very much for watching, and of course, to Boksu for sponsoring this video. And thank you, of course, to my ever beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, for it is by virtue of your support that I am able to carry on with my work. Until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.